let's take a step back. You go into a room with Robin Klein and Saul Klein, the most, two of the most powerful investors in Europe, nay, the world, and you reserve judgment on a company that you're pitching to them. Is that right? Of course. Why? Because I'm hoping that they're going to have trusted that I've taken judgment and respect my judgment, and then we'll, de we'll debate. You know, you lay the... What you is this, the Oxford the Union? <laughs> Come to our deal flow meetings. You know, everyone's more than welcome. Um, no, all of us? All, how many <laughs> people? Oh, quite a lot. Oh, we might not fit everyone, actually. But, uh. <laughs> so, yeah, that's interesting. So, because I think that's, we should return to this subject. But, I mean, what is, you know, let's, let's be honest. It's 2016. There's, uh, we've had, let's see, almost 10 years. Let's, let's call 2006 kind of like start a year. Um, 10, 10, 11 years. TechCrunch was founded in July 20, uh, 2005. I started writing for it in 2000 and... Ooh, who knows the answer to that question? Nobody knows. Um, I was freelancing, actually, in 2006. Um, and uh, and we, so we've had like 10 years of this enormous amount of growth. I think we could sort of bookend... Um, bookend things between sort of the coalition government and Brexit, couldn't we? There's silence no in the room. No one's really agreeing Everyone's here. going like, <laughs> oh, God, no, he said the word. <laughs> Terrible. Um, but why but, are you bookending it? Why well, are they, only on a continuation of the growth here? Well, don't you think, I mean, hold on a second. Don't you think, okay, spoken like a true VC, by the way. We're on the continuation of the growth. Everything's fine. Of course, we're keeping the lights on. The lights, are, the lights are definitely on, this is true. But um, I think we could bookend that era um, of enormous growth. I mean, you as an observer, I mean, I was looking at your uh, CV, um, and you've, uh, you've been an advisor on a, a, a number of companies, quite a lot of in medicine, I noticed. Um, so you've seen a few companies come and go. What's your been in your impression over the last few years about the quality of technology entrepreneurs, um, how, it, how it's changed over the last few years? Uh, I, you, know, you have to say it's dramatically improving. I think that you're right that, you know, if you look back to 2007 where London was then and the number of entrepreneurs were probably in you know, the hundreds rather than the thousands, and now we're probably in the tens of thousands. Um, and the quality is improving in both ways. I think that you know people are coming out of universities, and instead of looking to Goldman Sachs or McKinsey, they're now thinking, "Oh, I can start this. You know, I can actually do something. It's pretty easy to get going." And you're also seeing that second wave where you know, people who have been in high-growth tech companies, who have been in Zoopla or Grays or Transferwise, and they're thinking, "I know how to do this myself." So you're seeing kind of the experienced entrepreneurs, or even people you know, who have been, you know, VP level. Uh, head of products, etc., that are now starting their own thing, and people coming straight out of university. So there's just a wide spectrum of talent. Um, do you, but do you, that's a good question. Do you actually encounter those people? For instance, do you find an entrepreneur who says, comes in and says, you know, I was at Zoopla, or I was at Moo, or I was at, you know, a successful technology uh, company out of the UK or even out of Europe? I mean, just met a few weeks ago, Dimitar, who founded the Stack Overflow office in Europe, he's now started his own business, like one of a handful of many. So it's really, the, that, that, that has really upticked over the last couple of years? I think it, dramatically so in the last, yeah, probably 18 months. And I think that's what's particularly exciting about Europe at the moment, especially in the UK, who have had, what, over a third of Europeans, you know, billion dollar companies that we are now seeing you know, this kind of ecosystem taking the next step. And it's not only in founders, it's also angels. You know, Alex Chesterman or uh, Ed Ray or William Reeve, who are now angel investors and providing their own expertise and experience. William Reeve, uh, now he founded Gray, uh, Gray's or, no, he was in, what was he in? He um, was, it, uh, um, he was in Select, Gray's. Film Select, no. Film Select, no, Love which Film. One was in? Love Film, he was in and, Love Film. Um, right? And now at Hubbub. And, uh, yes, that's right. So, so, it, so, in a sense, the ecosystem that 
built Silicon Valley where you had initial entrepreneurs and then uh, they went on and became investors. You think that's spinning up now? I totally think that's spinning up. Well, you're a VC. I think so. Yes. Last I checked. It says on my CV. That's right. What do you think of the criticism that many entrepreneurs have of the European investor scene uh, in the sense that um, many investors are criticized for not having been entrepreneurs themselves. It's, you know, it, it's almost a, a rite of passage for many investors in, in the Valley and, and elsewhere to have actually been an operator. You know, uh, the VCs call them, yeah, he was an operator. That means he was an entrepreneur or he, she was an entrepreneur. Um, whereas a lot of VCs in Europe, especially in London as well, haven't been operators, haven't been entrepreneurs, haven't been blooded in that sense, uh, an old fox hunting term, uh, in that way. Do you think that puts the investors at a disadvantage, or do you think that gives them a more of a kind of an overview, an independent overview? So I think this will continue to be an ongoing debate amongst VCs. Um, it'll always be a debate. It'll always be a debate because there are those who are operators who obviously value operating experience and those who are investors like myself who have no operating experience but still like to think I might be a good investor. But I think that there are different skill sets that come from both and different experiences that come to both that are valuable for entrepreneurs. So I think that you know the best partnerships, the best VC partnerships will try and have a mix of both, um, because then you're kind of getting, you know, the all-rounder. Um, but, you know, for VCs, an element of it is, well, a large component of it is pattern recognition. So if you meet with hundreds and hundreds of startups and you invest in tens and you see what makes an exceptional company, then you start to know what you're looking for. And it becomes about benchmarks. And I fundamentally believe in the money ball of, you know, VC. I do think there's a level there of just kind of analytics that you can use to either find companies or help companies. I mean, even if you look at social and capital's eight ball and what they're doing in terms of sourcing companies. Um, but, you know, if you've been in a high growth startup and you've been in and you've founded, you know, they're not running VC funds, but if you founded Facebook, of course, you're going to have great operational experience that any founder would want to talk to you about building their business because you've seen it all and you've done it all. Um, so again, I think you know the best VC partnerships will have a mix of both. Do you, have you ever personally been charged with that um, criticism by an entrepreneur that you haven't operated? Uh, thankfully, no. No one's walked into a room and been like, "I'm not going to take your money because you haven't operated." But it, it is a topic that comes up, you know. Um, and I think you know you have to be honest. You get, you can't pretend to be something you're not. Do you do you do you feel like you're kind of like the uh, the, the general and the battlefield where you can see the whole battlefield instead of being in one section, as it were. Yeah, I think, you know, if you meet with 50 companies a week, and, you know, seed stage companies, you'd be able to, you can start to have a strong good idea of, you know, what makes a good founder, what is a good product, what does traction look like? Um, and you kind of do this again and again and again. And as I said, it's you know an element of pattern recognition. Um, and then once you've invested, as companies are growing from zero to 50 employees or on that journey, then they experience a lot of the same problems. Like, who are the hires that we need to make to execute on this product roadmap? Or, you know, uh, how do we hire for this role? Or how do we think about marketing? It, it's the same kind of questions that come up time and again. So, what's a, what sort of things do you think um, Europe is particularly good at certain things as opposed to certain some things as opposed to others? I mean, um, we're all familiar with the big consumer businesses that kind of come out of the states and the global platforms. Um, what do you think Europe is good at? Financial services, for sure. I think that you know London. I and mean, I know we're going to talk about Brexit because you can't have a panel these days without talking about Brexit. But London still remains, you know, the financial technology center of the world. Um, and we've seen great businesses being built and continue to be built uh, in Europe. So if you take 
I don't know, uh, ADM, for example, which is a payment processor mm -hmm. who are processing for the likes of Uber and Google, and there's no competitor in the US to them. Um, no competitor to ADM? I mean, yes, there's the comparative of Stripe, but if you get into the nitty gritty of what they actually do. Which do you think is better? ADM. Are you invested in ADM? No. Why not? Uh, why not? Index was. So where I used to work, they were invested. You were at Index? Yeah. Do you think another at the end could emerge, or do you think that game is over? Totally. I mean, if you look back, 2007. You, you think it could? I think it could emerge. Even if you, you know, 2007 was when Adian started. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a founder now in his bedroom thinking, I can build a better version of it. Why, why, why is that? Why do you think that game is still going? Because Surely payments is over. How, we still have to exchange cash. Ophelia, come on. Surely it's over. Well, we're just going to give everything for free and we're going to live in this yes. society where... Blockchain will take care of it, everything. We'll all live in a but hippie society ruled by who, cryptocurrency, will we not? Who's going to build the blockchain for transactions that we're all going to be happy with? I mean, we're only on 1.0 today, or 2.0. I forget which version we're now on, but I don't think it's over. You don't think it's over? I don't think it's over. Where, do, where, where are we then? Where are we in the cycle? Or not, forget the cycle. Where are we... Do you think we're sort of kind of in evolutionary terms, do you think uh, technology is um, kind of uh, at sort of homo sapien stage or Cro-Magnon man, Neanderthal, or are we still crawling out of the ocean? What's going on? Uh, I still think we're at the very early stages in a lot of industries. Like if you take, you know, the market cap of the top 30 fintech companies, it's like four trillion. If you take the total market value of uh, the biggest 30 startups in fintech, it's like 30 billion. Like, we're way off what we call proper disruption. Yeah. 30 billion versus? Four trillion. Four trillion. So you think, so the startups still have plenty of disruption plenty to go? Plenty of disruption to go. Especially in fintech, as you said. Especially in fintech. Surely, if you were an investor, you would just double down on fintech, you'd forget the rest, would you not? No, I think, well, you know, there are funds that do that. There's Ribbit Capital over in the US, so only a fintech-focused fund. There's Nigel Notion Morris's Capital. QED. They're enterprise. I don't think they'd call themselves only fintech. But True. there are investors that do take a sector-specific approach or, you know, a business model approach because they believe that by doubling down, they become more relevant to their founders, then they, uh, you know, they write some great content, they can build investment theses, they then attract great founders. So there are some benefits to going that way. Uh, the way that we're set up at Local Globe is that we actually took a geographic approach. So we said, you know, we want to be dedicated seed, um, and we want to work very closely with the founders that we're investing in. We know that seed is all about a very kind of intimate two-year journey up until Series A, and there's a lot of kind of uh, dialogue during those two years. We'd rather be close to the companies that we're investing in. Um, you know, very like, much like what they do in Silicon Valley, is that they won't even look outside kind of however many mile radius. Um, and, you know, we feel that there's a wealth of opportunity in the UK. Um, but then other funds, will, as they grow bigger, will go industry versus geography. You, you've gone for seed, but there's been some criticism in the sense that um, people will, uh, uh, sorry, um, investors have gone either for early stage or for, you know, mid to late. But there's this gap in the middle between seed funding and getting to your first Series A and maybe a Series A plus. Um, and that seems to have existed for quite a long time, especially in Europe. I mean, let's be brutally honest here. I mean, you know, seed funds were set up to get in early on the ground floor, were they not, right? I mean, actually, that's why index, where Index kind of cut its well, mustard to some extent. Index started in venture. Um, and I guess there's an argument to be said that seed is now what Series A was back in 2007 when people were raising kind of one to two million pounds as a Series A, and that's now a seed round. Um, but uh, okay, right. Let's do a straw poll. Who thinks one to two million pounds is a seed round, in your experience? Who thinks it's not? Oh, so lots Ooh. of disappointed entrepreneurs. So what? I'm what, going to come they, back see, at I, you with some data I've always here. thought that there's this kind of perception gap between entrepreneurs I speak to who go, like, we're trying to raise a seed fund of, like, 
250 to 500 or something, and then when I speak to VCs, they go, oh yeah, seed rounds a million or something. Don't you think there's a kind of a weird perception gap going on? There possibly is. We actually, we've done uh, the analysis. So, you know, Local Globe historically had something like 150 portfolio companies or has made 150 investments. And of the European ones, of kind of uh, over 100. The data clearly shows that an average seed round is about 1.4 million pounds. Uh, back in the days when, you know... Dollar, in the UK it, or it, across Europe, Europe or... Across Europe. Right. Um, and you know, that's back in the day when dollar FX was good and it was $2 million. And that was now before the, the pound was worth less than the Greek yeah. drachma. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a seed round. But I think it, people were calling things, you know, different. You could raise 300,000 and call it a seed. It depends what kind of shareholders agreement and what you're issuing. But, you know, a seed round is about 1.5 million pounds. And you should consider it as that, that point when you're ready to take institutional capital. You probably have a product that addresses a very large market that you're going after and you have a great team, but you need help to kind of scale that product and think, prove kind of product market fit. And that's about an 18-month journey until you raise your Series A. So I think the ecosystem here is becoming more delineated that there's friends and family or pre-seed, and then there's seed, and then there's mm. Series A and beyond. Mm. OK, let, just quickly, let's talk briefly about like, what, what's, what does Local Globe do? Where does it sit in the market? Um, what do you bring to the party that an entrepreneur couldn't get from any other seed fund? So we are a dedicated seed fund. Um, I, you know, I worked with Robin and Saul at Index for about four years and really saw a gap in the market, in the European market, uh, for what we call dedicated seed, which to us is helping entrepreneurs, as I said, on that journey from uh, when they're ready to take our money to a Series A. And again, going back to the data, um, if you look at across our portfolio, and I'm sure this bears out if we were to do the run of all other European companies that have raised seed money, that of all C companies that went on to raise a Series A, 90% of those companies do it within 18 months, and the average is about you have long after raising your seed round to think about when you should next be pitching investors. And so our promise to the founders that we invest in is that we will work with you very closely over that period to help, help make sure that you can go and raise capital from Tier 1 VCs. Um, and knowing how these VCs will pick apart your product and your growth and your distribution and your team, we sit down with you at the point of investment and say, okay, we think these are the milestones that you have to hit according to product, team, growth, unit economics. And if you've only got, you know, 15 months, well, then working back, this is what you have to achieve at, you know, 300 days, 180 days, 90 days. And let's kind of think about all of this stuff right now because the clock is going to start ticking. Um, and so you can kind of imagine how that, that kind of interactions build up. Um, so for that reason, 70% of our fund will go to the UK, and then 30% of it will go uh, US, Europe, but we still want to partner with a co-lead who's there on the ground with the entrepreneur. And I suppose, actually, you know, let's set aside the whole Europe thing for a second. Um, you, see, you see so much, comp so many key people come into the UK, especially into London, from continental Europe or internationally, that to some extent that still ends up being quite international anyway. Oh yeah, I mean, the whole reason that Brexit is so concerning to us is that we do have an inordinate amount of talent here that isn't from London, and I hope that it only stays that way. Um, and you know, you rely on kind of these multicultural teams and being able to scale effortlessly from London into other countries without, you know, it's like people coming here from Europe who suddenly know what London's all about. Go on then, let's, let's, let's sort of bite the, bite the bullet. What do you think Brexit will do to the UK technology scene? Ooh, <laughs> sounds mm. like there's some uh, strong opinions in any, the audience here. <laughs> any levers here? We have a, a firing squad over there yeah. in the corner. No, Dave. I'm joking, I'm joking, it's totally fine. I'm joking, I'm joking. It's, I'm just joking. It's a joke. Um, what? <laughs> it's, it's just a joke. It, we're all tolerant, ladies and gentlemen. Let's have tolerance. What do you, what in in business terms? What do you think 
uh, the uh, Britain leaving the European Union will do to the technology scene. How do we, uh, will it, um, not seen, but industry, shall we, uh, will we uh, innovate out of it? Will it be uh, a sort of a, a bit of a hit to begin with and we'll sort of accelerate out? What do you think is going to happen? I know it sounds kind of uh, the weak answer, but I don't think anyone can really say with any certainty that we know what's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, the politicians themselves don't know what's going to happen. They don't even know how to negotiate a trade agreement. Like, we're just so in the middle of it. The last uh, article, you read an article every morning, we're either leaving in 2020 or 2021, and these are the reasons why we're not going to leave, and this is the reason why it's never going to happen. And this is the worst part. It's the uncertainty. Yeah. It's the people who are sitting in startups thinking, wait, am I going to be here in two years' time? Am I suddenly going to be extradited from the UK because I don't have a UK, I'm not a UK resident? Mm. And the worst part right now, as you say, we can see it in the currency, right? So you know, people's hosting costs, people's marketing spend, a dollar dominated. Because they're, maybe they're going Amazon S3 in dollars. And exactly, yes, and their right. revenues are in pounds. And the worst part is the actual early stage startups are the ones that are most affected by this, rather yeah. than you know, larger companies like Funding Circle who have dollar exposure through revenues and probably hedge their cash, et cetera, so they're not as affected. Um, that's, you know, yeah. talent and costs are the most concerning things at the moment. Talent and costs. Um, do you think there's a sort of, is there some, some sort of upside in the sense that perhaps government policy or, or, or something will be motivated to try and innovate our way out of a, a sticky business at the moment to um, uh, Rohan Silver, who used to work for David Cameron, said we should bring in artificial intelligence to uh, process visa, visa applications much faster and things like that. Oh, it's, it's, like, it's like running, running a country with HAL 9000 or something. I think uh, no matter what you say, uh, the country spoke. And then, you know, these times will call for change. And I think it's a time of reflection to see where the opportunities are and the good opportunities for change. You know, why the pound is weak. You know, startups just got a whole lot cheaper to fund if you're outside the UK. Boom. And a whole lot cheaper to be acquired if you're thinking about that too. So, you know, there were some definite positives. Little startup called Arm got acquired <laughs> for possibly that reason. Exactly. Um, so I think that this will provoke some good change and you know in every crisis is born a good entrepreneur so do you think as investors you will deploy more of your capital to continental europe or to to, to uh, companies inside the the official eu our strategy remains zero changed by brexit we were very positive in the uk before brexit and we remain extremely positive in the uk do you uh, one last question on brexit do you think that the people uh, the uh, general partners will in uh, sorry uh, will LPs invest um, more or less in, in UK venture capital funds, or do you think they'll spread their, spread their bets a bit more? So I would think that LPs would see through kind of the noise and the news headlines, et cetera, and actually wait to make a proper informed decision when we have some concrete knowledge and information about how this is going to affect us. But anyone who's pulling out today because of Brexit I mean, that's just an excuse. Yeah. So, so it, any kind of bad news that happens, they're just using Brexit as an excuse. I think so. That's interesting as a journalist, that's for sure. Interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. I, I think this is, you know, we, we've seen this in the past at big global events whenever there's bad news. What's the phrase? Uh, good day to bury bad news, unfortunately. But, yes. I think you're correct in the sense that um, it's pretty much everything is unchanged. Whatever happens, happens in the next couple of years. But um, certainly from my perspective as a journalist, um, speaking to uh, companies, um, there's no sort of immediate pressure um, to, to do anything. I have unfortunately heard th people, things, people sort of saying, right, I've got to make a decision. And I think this is much more, and I think probably you've probably got a few things, thoughts on this, is is if you are continental European and you're in the UK, are you, going to, are you going to commit? Are you going to buy the house? Are you going to bring up the kids, et cetera? What are you going to do? And that's the kind of questions that some people have to face. And I think, you know, again, my concern would be if you're coming out of university and you're not a UK resident, are you suddenly going to think, well, am I going to stay here? 
and start building a life here? Or am I going to go to Berlin where, you know, equally good startup scene, lots of interesting things going on? You just don't know. And I don't know how someone makes that decision right now. Yeah. Like, how do you decide whether to buy a house because of what might happen with Brexit? I yeah, mean, yeah. we're talking now, I think, realistically, a couple of years off. Yeah. So I, don't I think we have a two-year window to make up our minds, don't we? Theresa May, wherever you are. OK. Now, let's get back to tech. So um, in terms of like, um, there's been a bit of a boom. There's been quite a lot of funds created over the last couple of years. Um, do you think there's kind of a, too, many, too many investors now floating around? There's, there's a whole bunch of sort of the main ones that we know about. There's so many accelerators now. What do you think about the boom in accelerators in, in London, it's particularly so, in London? Let's start with uh, the boom in funds. Yeah which I think is only a positive thing. I mean, again, we're an ecosystem that's trying to grow up like the Valley and look at how many funds the Valley has and they're still saying that there isn't enough capital at certain stages. So I think it's welcome that there are more funds in Europe. Something like close to a thousand funds in the Valley. Is, is that the total? Something along the line, there's about minimum 750, say 800, yeah. So, you know, I'm all welcome for more capital in Europe, and I think more funds should be started by good investors. Um, and I think that at the accelerators, you know, I think it, some remain to be seen, but some are doing an, such an impressive job. And, you know, Seed Camp continues to amaze me as entrepreneur first. What are they now in their sixth cohort? And the, com the quality of They're the about companies... about five minutes old, those guys. The quality of the companies coming out. Um, you know, Alice and Matt have done an absolutely tremendous job. Uh, I, I would, fr frankly, I would concur. I, I agree. Um, do you think... You spoke about Berlin a second ago. Um, they, there was, wasn't there a fantastic... Uh, uh, what? Well, Fantastic and in a slightly ironic sense to see billboards for move to Berlin uh, the day after Brexit. That was rather hilarious. Um, Were they sponsored by Airbnb? No, that was sp it wasn't sponsored. It was sponsored by a German politician um, who decided to uh, put these <laughs> this this uh, pla uh, this big you know big banner on wheels going around Shoreditch. It was rather funny. Um, are, you, are you tempted to move? Uh, darling, no. <laughs> London's the best city in the world. Come on. Um, yes, you can clap. Yes. Rock and roll. Um, I think you just woke apart up. Apart from the fact that I was you. born here, I might as well stay. <laughs> um, what the hell? Uh, you mentioned Berlin. Now, in Europe, we've got an amazing scene in Stockholm now. Amazing, you know, good scene in Berlin. It's probably, I'd say, number two after London. Still quite small. Three and a half million people versus London's, what, eight, ten million? Um, yep in terms of Paris is kind of interestingly motoring up now, blah, blah, car coming out, Sigfox. The family are doing The family things. are an incredible accelerator, really cool guys. Um, they've really kind of like um, got their act together over the last couple of years. Uh, entrepreneurship is back, back in fashion in, in the, the home of the word. The uh, Barcelona, interestingly going for internet things, a lot of gaming companies coming out of Barcelona. Yeah. Um, Typeform is the last investment that type I helped form. lead you were, you were actually in yeah. Typeform, weren't you? Yeah. Um, what was Typeform again? I can't remember. <laughs> they create beautiful online forms and services. Oh, Typeform. Yeah. You've probably seen it a million times. Yes, I I'm have. I'm sure yes. you have. Yeah. Why, why do people like that? I think it's, it's forms. But it's design. How could you invest I mean, the in forms? The completion rate on Typeforms are over 55% compared to a And that makes it an investable company? Yeah. I mean, think how... Over a Google think Doc? Think how many... F do you know how bad a, a Google form is? I've filled out Google forms. What you the hell? You can't do it on mobile. I mean, I was filling in a Google form... But Pinch. it's such a painful process. What do you think the drop-off rate is for that? If okay. you're a business where forms are integral to your product, something so like Typeform... Why doesn't Google just iterate and kill Typeform? Why doesn't Google do a lot of things? True. I mean, there are a lot that, of areas Don't you where find it annoying? Or entre how entrepreneurs must find this so annoying. VCs say this all the time. Google could do that. Google could do that. How would Google not do that? <laughs> oh, my God. This is the lamest question from any investor. What's, do you ever have to I've ask? I've never asked that. Oh, thank I've never you. asked that. You deserve a round of applause Thanks. for never answering that asking that question. For heaven's sake. 
Yeah, what, there's no... Go, look at the amount that Google spends now on acquiring companies where there's clearly, it's either a skills gap for them or it's a you know, technology this is gap. Our, but this is our disadvantage. You, you know, we're not in the valley. Those guys all acquire each other because they're all, they all drink in the same bars. Magic Pony was uh, an EF company that was recently acquired. I think that what, you, what Europe <coughs> really needs to see is founders going the full way. Like, don't sell out early. Don't sell for 150, 200, 250. Go, you know, don't be scared that Google's going to build it themselves or Facebook's going to build it themselves. I actually believe in yourself that you can build it yourself. Yeah, so round of applause for that, I think. Motivation. Inspiring words. Um, okay, right. What do you look for in a company? What, what do you, what, when, do, when does the hairs on the back of your neck go up when you see a company? Uh, for me, it's... A mixture of two, well... That you like, I mean. That I, <laughs> Not the one that you don't like. One screaming from the room. Yeah. I think it always starts with uh, a mix of... Well, the founder will impress you from the first minute in. Um, you know, if you're meeting with tens of founders a week, you do know when someone walks in and he's just... Or she's just got it. Um, and the next thing is definitely the idea, because if they were pitching you something that wasn't interesting, I mean great, you met a nice person, but that's not going to change your day. Um, and when you say, talk about an idea, at seed stage, it's very much, you know, are you solving a problem that goes after a very large market? That's my fundamental concern. I'm less worried about business model and users, etc. but I would like to see someone who I want to back as a founder who's going to go and build something revolutionary. The, uh, a lot of uh, VCs in Europe um, like to lead, see traction or growth um, rather than just somebody with an idea, though, right? So I think traction and growth becomes very important for the Series A raise. I think for seed, you, you know, you'll probably be in beta or you probably would have given your product to your friends and family and called them users. Um, <laughs> I think that it's much more about the quality of the technology the potential the idea has. I mean, obviously, there's a product that you can see, but it's probably not ready to scale to hundreds of thousands of users at that stage. Um, and it's very much the team who are going to execute on it. I have to say that the one change from leaving Index to being at Local Globe is that now if I see or I'm told about a company doing something that I find vaguely interesting, I always meet the entrepreneurs because it's those people that you know are either going to make it or break it. Um, and it is about meeting the person and seeing what... Do you f ever find that you meet slightly on the spectrum, and, but they've got, they've got a brilliant idea, um, but they can't really quite communicate it, and you go, well, they've got an incredible idea, incredible potential, but they're not really the front person or whatever? Yeah, I think you have to expect that a lot of the time, you know, founders who are coming to meet, especially seed investors, have not done a pitch before. They don't know the lingo, and you know they're probably all about the best ones. Will be all about the product, and they might get lost and get their excitement of telling you about why that what they're building is so you know powerful, valuable, etc. And just bear with them. But I think the important thing is for the next stage of investment, it's almost at Series A you're expected to know the world of VC. Like you need to go in there and you do need to understand exactly what product market fit means. And you need right. to know, you know your CAC to your LTV. And if you don't have all of that stuff, then... So the seed investors hopefully will be a little bit kinder. But it's our role to, to help at that stage. Exactly, that's right. Uh, right, Chris, um, I wanted to ask you about some big trends going on. What's your view? I mean, I'm sure you read up about this sort of thing all the time. Um, Chris Dixon, a uh, great investor in New York, um, wrote a really great post uh, literally a couple of days ago um, called the what was it, um, 11, 11 Reasons, reasons to, to Be, be excited, Optimistic or Excited, or excited about, about the, the Future. Was it the Future or the Technology? Future, yeah. I think it was the Future, wasn't it? Possibly. Yeah. Um, and I've got the 11 Reasons right here, so we're going to do a quick fire round, right, with you. Right. Okay. That's right. Am I guessing or knowing whether you, I'm you, excited? You can do whatever you like, yes or no, or no, so or I'm gonna, what? I have a view already before you even start. About what? About the 11 reasons to be well, excited. Well, can I just not read them out? No, no, we can get to the reasons. That's my job here. <laughs> Come on, okay. gonna, what I'll, I'll withhold we're Drivers in this car are going to replace <laughs> taxi drivers, and I'm being replaced by the interviewee. 
Come on. You're going to be replaced by a chap. By a chap. By a chap. We don't even need you anymore. Is this? Are these people? Are these people being nasty to us on Twitter? I hate this shit. Okay. Right. Okay. No, I haven't been replaced yet. I'm still a human being. Right. Cars. Yes. Thoughts. I think that you know self-driving cars are coming. Tra- Pit- or transport. What, when is it? Pittsburgh next week. Pittsburgh with Uber. Uber. I mean, but they are going to have someone in it and a co-pilot. So we have. They'll sit there, just with the hands off the wheel. Exactly. Never touching anything. Um, no, it's coming. It's definitely coming. Or the, the one step. Are there opportunities when you have such large companies like Uber and Google doing that kind of technology? Are there opportunities for entrepreneurs? You know, at that level. Yeah. In Who's going to build the insurance for self-driving cars? Good question. Ah, that's what I want to know. Who's going to build the insurance? Okay, right. Energy. Is there batteries? Ooh, I think VCs have been badly burned on clean energy, so we'll see. I think I, yeah, it's the way we're going. Maybe, we maybe. have to go, um, but I'm not sure that we're suddenly going to see billions of dollars of VC investment in the space. Maybe companies that can monitor energy or save energy or. Um, VR and AR, what's your view? Very early stages. Um, but like all of these reasons that Chris wrote on, I think that you know, Chris is a visionary VC, but if you actually think about the dollar investment of VC money into each of these categories, it's still very low. And what, most of these are kind of at their infancy, I would say. Who thinks VR and AR is going to be the next big thing? Put your hand up. God, no, almost nobody. Wow. Who thinks it's not the next big thing? VR and AR. Oh, you're, you're There's a undecided. lot of apathy in this Come audience. Come on, guys, have an opinion. Come on. <laughs> you're asking questions to Brits. Yes, we're asking questions to Brits, I know. Um, drones. Yes. Again. Like it? It's like I'm, I'm an Happy? insurance broker today, but we have a company in our portfolio that's doing spot insurance for drones. Blockchain, cryptocurrency. Again, in its infancy, I mean, how many applied uses do we have of this uh, technology yet? I think, it, you know, it's fascinating. It has the potential to revolutionize a multitude of industries. But you know, if you, you go and pitch the CEO of Santander and tell them that you want to do invoice financing for them on the blockchain, you know, what's the sales cycle on that? You're, the fintech theme is really coming okay, through we can here. Get it, we can get into something else. My mind's hooked. Art, artificial intelligence... Very positive, very, very positive. Do you think we have an edge here in Europe or the UK? Totally, I think that, you know, the quali- this comes back to, you know, the quality of students coming out of uh, uh, universities that, you know, are starting companies today. I mean, you're learning from the best minds at Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial, LFC, etc. And some of the best companies are being built here. I mean, look at the research that DeepMind is doing. And thank God that they're still open with their research and still publishing a lot of what they're discovering. That's an extremely good point. Um, right, well, let's, let's dish the list. Lastly, I want to ask you something I think you're um, increasingly passionate about, um, getting women involved in entrepreneurship. But you've got some interesting views about this. Um, you know, it's not just about getting women in tech. What, what is it in your view? Uh, this, so I kind of shiver women in tech because I think it's a glib thing for saying we should be doing something about it. I'm far more interested in actually hearing and deciding together what should be done. So we know the age old problem, there are enough, not enough female students in STEM subjects, etc. We need to help get these people through uh, to studying more at university and at schools. But women in technology companies now, you know, once you're in there, once you're in startups, what are the challenges that you're facing? How can you be helped? I don't believe it's just about female, you know, backing female founders. I think it's actually understanding and talking about the issues more, more often and more in the public domain. Because I think that, you know, you have these kind of women in tech events for two hours, but are we actually helping? So what do you think the answer is? Do you, um, because a lot of those questions tend to go down a kind of cul-de-sac, don't they? What do you think the answer is? I think the answer... If, if it's talking about it, how? I think the answer lies in some kind of uh, broad mentor program, actually. I think that women helping other women or even kind of having some men in the fray. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, one stat that shocked me is that actually, while, you know, in startups you might get, say, the 
best in classes, like 50-50 women and men uh, at the kind of junior level, that women aren't promoted up through the ranks. And so as we talk about those big exits coming from Europe and, you know, the VPs and the C-levels going on to start companies, if we can't get women to that stage, then how do we hope that they'll then come, go on to be angel investors or found companies, et cetera. So I think that mentorship is, you know, one possible solution, but I'm more here saying kind of, please, you know, talk about it. Let me know what the issues are. And, and, um, and help people, simple as that. Hopefully right? so. It's a good message to end on. Hey, Philly Brown, thank you very much. Thank I, it's you. It's been a pleasure to interview you. I hope you have a, go a nice evening, everyone. And we'll be around to talk, I guess. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. I think we're meant to... Do we...